Okay, thank, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you to John for uh, having me out here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my talk's going to be a little different than the first uh, two wonderful talks we heard today. Um, in those, they sort of focused on ideology, how it's represented in the mind, and what having different ideologies then means um, for maybe the way we see the world, um, the types of attributions we make. What I'm going to focus on instead, really, is how certain situations or contexts can actually affect um, outcomes that we think are ideologically relevant. Judgments that we think we're making or tend to be thought of as ideological actually can be influenced in really interesting ways by different um, situations. Um, and some of these outcomes, I think, are also very relevant to the kind of things um, legal scholars and lawyers and so forth are interested in. So the theoretical starting point um, for my talk in general comes from several theories that argue that people are motivated to perceive their social systems as just and fair and legitimate. Um, this is probably most famously traced back to Mel Lerner's work on a belief in just world. Um, and in that theory, what Lerner argued was that people have this motivation to view social outcomes as fair in the sense that they're deserving. Um, and that people also possess sort of an, an arsenal of psychological tools that helps us to see outcomes as representative of fairness, even if they're not. Um, my research is actually more directly um, influenced by system justification theory. Uh, Mazarin already talked a little bit about it. And system justification theory is clearly influenced by belief in just world theory. But one big difference between them is system justification theory draws a very um, direct line of reasoning to say that people should also be motivated to not justify the outcomes they see in the world, but the systems that actually control these outcomes. Um, what we mean by systems, um, I don't know if Mazarin's ever even seen this definition. Uh, we didn't really define that in the early stages of the work. Um, I've recently defined it, and this is one way we like to think of systems. Um, we refer to them as uh, systems. Um, they can be things that are very concrete and objective, such as the governments and institutions, which are companies, universities, religions, etc., with which people are affiliated, or more abstract as well, um, such as generally accepted but unwritten social norms and rules. These are things like family structure, group norms, um, and the like. Now, um, the first, or what I like to think of as the first generation of system justification work, mainly focused on demonstrating that this motivation does exist. People do have a motivation to justify the status quo. Um, the second generation of work, which is um, what we're very busily doing at University of Waterloo right now, um, has focused really on two other issues. We're sort of agreeing that this motivation does exist, and now we're asking two other questions. First, we're asking, what are the psychological causes or motivational antecedents to why we have this motivation? So in this work, we're basically trying to, dis to discover why are people motivated to justify the status quo? Why does this happen? Um, in the second line of research that we're very busily working on, we are interested in understanding the consequences of the system justification motive. And in particular, the consequences this motive holds for the perpetuation or the maintenance of inequality. Um, and so my remarks today are largely going to focus on this second um, line of research. In particular, I'm going to talk about, I think, uh, three or four studies, each drawn from different papers, that give you an idea of how our motivation to justify the status quo can actually lead to negative things like uh, the maintenance of inequality. Now, you might assume, and it's reasonable to assume, that it actually is relatively adaptive psychologically to not be in constant hatred of the systems that control us. Um, and that does make good sense. The only problem where this sort of falls apart is that when our systems have faults in them that perpetuate inequality or that force inequality upon um, people, then justifying them um, can lead to certain problems. I'm going to try and illustrate that through some selective studies from this program of work. OK, so in general, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about four different studies, or maybe three. We'll see how much time I have. In each of them, what we do is we provide a situational manipulation that increases this motivation to justify the status quo. And then we look at its effects on various things. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about its effects on evaluations of women attempting to enter male-dominated careers, um, what it does to people's explanations for societal inequality, what increasing the justification motive does for preferences for traditional rather than modern women, and last, um, its effects on the defense of those in positions of power, such as politicians. OK, so in this first study, I'm going to talk about the effects of bringing about this motive or strengthening the desire to justify your status quo on evaluations of and treatment of people who sort of enter, uh, who act counter to the status quo. Um, and to do this, I first want to just define a couple of um, psychological definitions. 
that will help you with the theory here. Um, descriptive norms. What descriptive norms are, are norms that represent how people think things are. That is, what is. So in the context of women in business, the descriptive norm might be um, there are not that many women in high power positions in the business world relative to men. That's a descriptive norm. An injunctive norm, on the other hand, is perceptions of what should be the case. So an injunctive norm would be, um, in the context of women in business, for example, is that women should be in positions of high power. And descriptive norms and injunctive norms can differ. So for instance, lots of work on littering shows that although the descriptive norm is that people see there's litter all over the place, um, the injunctive norm is that everyone knows that you shouldn't litter. So these things can be different. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that because of the system justification motive, especially when it's strengthened, we tend to, or we suggest that people may actually take their descriptive norms and then transfer them psychologically into injunctive. They may see what is out there and then view that as what should be. Now this idea is sort of, um, uh, may resemble to you the idea of the naturalistic fallacy. And so G.E. Moore coined the term the naturalistic fallacy really was a philosophical argument or arguments against philosophical arguments um, as the false belief that whatever is natural is necessarily good. Um, in more, sort of in more common parlance now, we think of the naturalistic fallacy as basically any assumption regarding the way things should be based on the way things are. And so what I'm going to argue um, is that people commit this naturalistic fallacy and that it is motivated um, and that it has important consequences. So our model in, um, for this study in a little more specific terms, basically what we're proposing is that um, when the motivation to justify the system is increased, people are going to become more likely to see what is, in this case, the underrepresentation of women in the, in the business world, as what should be. They're going to think women actually should not be in the business world because of this motivation. And then once you um, sort of injunctify this norm, turn it from descriptive to injunctive, that's going to lead to many downstream consequences. Now, we've researched a bunch, though what I'm going to present today is the derogation of individuals who try to act counter to that norm. OK, so to do this, uh, all, these, all these studies that I'm going to talk about were run in Canada, so we're always dealing with Canadian systems and, and so forth. Um, what we have is participants come into the lab, and the experimenter, who is a woman, um, first gives them a booklet, and this booklet we manipulate two different things. First thing we do is we, for half of them, we strengthen their system justification motive. Um, for half of them, we sort of weaken it. The way we do that is we expose them to what we call a manipulation of system threat. Now, the logic behind threatening a motive to increase it it's sort of similar to the idea, um, there's basically an accepted idea that if you have a motivation and you're trying to, to find an end state, and if we block you from getting to that end state, you're going to have that motivation even stronger. So for example, think of hunger. If I want you to be really, really hungry, we all have this motivation, what I'm going to do is give you less food, and then your, your, your motivation to eat is going to be even larger. So we apply that same logic um, when we're trying to strengthen the system justification motive. So for half our experiments, we um, strengthen their motive, for half we weaken it, um, and then we basically manipulate um, information regarding how many women actually are in positions of high power in the business world. And so here's an example of what our, one of our system threat manipulations look like. They would read this thinking that it's from a foreign journalist and that they're doing a memory task and they have to memorize this, this passage and they're going to be asked questions about it later. I put the United States in here um, just so as Americans you get a feel for what it would be like reading it. But basically in the high threat condition, um, they read, these days, many people in the U.S. feel disappointed with the con nation's condition. They feel the country has reached a low point in terms of social, economic, and political factors. And it goes on to say more negative things. In reading this now, we wrote this in maybe 2000 or 2001. It feels sort of prophetic all of a sudden. Um, so some people read this, and they get this high threat condition. Others are put in a low threat condition. There, Here they read that things are going relatively well, or at least an outsider is saying things are going relatively well. 